thank you, Pamela. Once again, I'm uh, George Isham. I'm the co-chair of the uh, roundtable along with David. And uh, we are going to interrupt the flow of the uh, meeting for something pretty important. Uh, you know, we have had, um, as a roundtable, uh, we have sponsored a series of, I think, vital dialogues on what, can, uh, what some of the key issues are in terms of improving the broader health of the nation and how health care fits into that, as well as the other social determinants of health. And in the course of that uh, dialogue, uh, have the roundtable itself has been looking for an opportunity to hear from the president of the Institute of Medicine, Victor Zhao, who is now with us, Dr. Victor Zhao. And so uh, for those of you on the webinar and those of you joining us remotely as well as those in the room, uh, please indulge us as we take a very short uh, opportunity to one, hear the comments of Dr. Zhao, and then secondly, hopefully take a couple of, of questions and answers. So uh, it's my, indeed my great pleasure today to introduce to you Dr. Victor Zhao, eighth president of the Institute of Medicine. He's Chancellor Emeritus and James R. Duke Professor of Medicine at Duke University and the past president and CEO of Duke University Health System. Previously, Dr. Zhao was the Hershey Professor of Theory and Practice in, of Medicine and Chairman of Medicine at Harvard Medical School's Brigham and Women's Hospital, as well as the Chairman of the Department of Medicine at Stanford University. His six-year term as President of the Institute of Medicine began in July of 2014, so at the beginning of his term, it's indeed a pleasure for us to have the opportunity to hear him. Dr. Zhao. Thank you, you Josh. Sit right there. We don't have to move. My apology. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know that my introduction was meant to be a disruption to your meeting. <laughs> uh, this uh, turned out to be a good time for me, and uh, so I apologize. I really should be here first thing in the morning, but I had to do, go to two other uh, meetings to opening. But this is really so important, so thank you. Thank you, George, for inviting me. You know, I mean, when I look at the attendance to this room and people coming from all different sectors, I know there are people from public health areas, but also development, housing, education, philanthropy, healthcare, private industry, and others. That really reflects what we're trying to do, right? It is about all of us working together to make a healthier community and healthier population. And I know from my own experience that population health is not just about health care, but it's about getting everybody together to create the right environment that can improve community as a whole, and certainly health is a very important outcome of that success. You know, for me, um, many of you may or may not know me, but I am a physician scientist, but over the years, as you heard, I've taken on some administrative uh, role, although I still run a research lab, but I would say that from my own journey as a physician and a administrator and a healthcare leader, I've learned so much about the importance of engaging everyone in the health of the population. Uh, certainly in my last 10 years at Duke, when I first arrived there, I said, access, let's just create more clinic, let's create more places for people who have no access and no means. But quickly I realized, certainly in a community as Durham as in any other community, and the good thing was small, that uh, you know there's so many other aspects, uh, challenges that we face. And of course, ultimately, it's all us coming together to find the solutions. So health really is really everybody's responsibility and involves so many stakeholders. The other thing I learned and it's particularly relevant to here is how to link these issues to policy. So I always say that my years, uh, you know, working in the front line, if you will, and closely with community on many issues beyond health, I've been heavily involved with education, with disconnected youth, or marginalized youth and others, tells me that you can't make policies without being connecting to the people on the ground and what's really happening. It's too easy for us to think about the right thing to do without paying attention to all the consequences, if not all the relatedness. And so that interaction with everybody is so important. And of course, as you know, as we said in healthcare, it's so complex. 
and there are so many issues, so that as we begin to look at how policies are being made in Washington or elsewhere in the state or regionally, you know, frequently we make policy based on what we can see is the right thing, but frequently not realizing that there are so many other factors that impact them. So clearly the participation of multiple stakeholders uh, and everybody to address these issues, many complex issues must be considered, uh, you know, because what seems to make one sense in one area may have unintended consequences on the other. This is why this meeting is really so important. Complex issues. It's time that we use, you know, the tools that's available everywhere to make this decision to understand the, the impact of one decision on so many others. One of the first thing, um, well, first of all, of course, in this area, we're talking about transportation, education, housing, you name it, right? Environment, all of them are very important. So, as I said, one of the first report I got involved with when I got here actually was a modeling on food systems. And it was really quite interesting to look at the whole chain of food systems from people growing the crops, farmers, all the way to, of course, you, you know, food services, you name it and how complex that issue is if you make decision about growing corn. What's the implication on all the other things and the implication on, on the economy? Or to say that you should all eat fish, you know? <laughs> and so I think that it, the complexity is very clear. And of course, more recently we've been involved, in fact, on the public health implications of raising minimal age or legal access tobacco products, but also looking at modeling. And I know you heard from EPA and tobacco about the importance of modeling. So to me, there's no question that we need to start thinking about the use of all the tools available to us. Not perfect, by any means. There's criticism for sure. Some tools are, you know, tools are what they are. Models are what they are. But however, the ability to put complex consideration into uh, decisions is critically important. You know, this workshop, uh, builds in part from a study done by I IOM and National Research Council that recommend applying predictive and system-based simulation models uh, to understand health consequences of underlying determinants of health and access the unintended and intended effects related to policy investments and need to quantify, communicate uncertainty to decision makers. I put them in quotes. So you can see the roots of this. And I think that we are behind, I believe, uh, than others. For example, my understanding is EPA doesn't make a single policy decision, am I right? Without, in fact, considering you know, use of modeling. So I think that this meeting is important for all the reasons I told you about. Now, you know, I think that for me, coming into IOM, it's a very exciting time. As you know, uh, you know, we have our challenges, but I think finally the nation's talking about access, quality, and affordability. You know, even as I read last few days, I was in Texas speaking to a lot of business people and healthcare. I think that now everybody says, okay, we can continue doing what we're doing. So we, it's a time of change. The other exciting thing, of course, is that technology is now is available. The technology that we've never had before so despite the fact change is very difficult, trying to do things differently than the way we've always done them, and we're always aware about you know, patient, you know, provider relationship, the time to spend, I think we can do the right thing by bringing all these things together. And I strongly believe innovation technology is a big part of a solution for the future. Not to put a distance from providers of patients, but to bring in additional tools that can get to where we have not been able to get to. And also at the same time, being able to not only improve healthcare, but in reduce costs as well. So I like to see IOM as a more dynamic organization. We've always been right in the forefront. We've always been there asking the questions and providing the right analysis. But I would say it's time that we also broaden further horizon touch on many different disciplines. I'm also very interested in impact. Uh, it's always been said by many people that we do a lot of reports, but we don't always necessarily see it through or what happens to them. So a lot of my effort right now is thinking about 
clear strategies that if we start a study, let's think about how we're going to disseminate, communicate this, get the stakeholders, decision makers see it, and really having an impact. I want to give you one example. So we just, in the summer, released a report on end-of-life care called Dying America. How many people have seen this? Right? I mean, it's an amazing report. Here's one example where the government would not ask us to do this for obvious reasons, right? We did it. We raised the money for it. But more importantly, did we not, not only did we address the issue in a very objective, you know, uh, and a comprehensive way of planning, preferences, cultural diversity, training the providers to have conversation, training people to know how to use hospice palliative care. We eventually talk about if you do the right thing, costs will come down. And that's some legislative changes that can integrate social and medical services. What's great about this is the dissemination. We followed up by having meeting with stakeholders and uh, like AMA, AAMC, Nursing Association, Congress, etc. Three weeks ago, we had a meeting in the auditorium. There are 600 some people participated in a summit that we brought senators together and a conversation about it's time to change. And you know, we're very encouraged to say that we connected with the policymakers, we connect with the stakeholders who's going to change training. And I ask everyone who attended representing large organizations to write a commitment statement. We have 60 such statements that says we're going to make these changes in our organization. American College of Surgeons says we're going to introduce training into our training program on end-of-life care. That's what I hope we can accomplish here. I think what you're going to do is so impactful that people are going to really remember how to work with so many smart people in different di sectors to make the right decision, which will be improving our population health. Thank you very much. Sure. sure. I think I've disrupted your meeting already, but. <laughs> I would say, one, uh, well, thank you very much. But, uh, sec you know, really striking the theme of being part of a dynamic uh, institute of medicine and really thinking about our impact, our, our issues that need to shape the roundtable conversation and have, have been a part of it. If there are a question or two or comment for Dr. Sao, particularly for members of the roundtable, we have maybe a moment. Thank you for doing this great work. Well, thank you so much thank for you. being with us. Really thank appreciate you. that. Thank you, George. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.